Time is 2.30, so let's get started here. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, day number one quiz, all of you completed it, so you all got five points out of five possible. Uh, project number one, um, I have, have them here. We will discuss them towards the end of the class. Are there any questions before we get, before we get started? Okay, so we left off last time on approximately page... 24. We were talking about confidence intervals for a pro probability of a success. In particular, we had uh, discussed the walled interval. Just as a reminder, this is what it looks like. Pi hat, which is your uh, observed number of successes out of the out of total number of trials. It's a proportion. A plus or minus the one minus alpha divided by two quanta from a standard normal times the square root of pi hat times one minus pi hat all over n. Okay. And we also discussed how you know there are some issues with this interval. We'll see some dramatic uh, problems uh, with it as we go along today. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about the recommendations given in the Brown et al. 2001 paper about well, what should you use for this simple problem of calculating a, a confidence interval for probability of success, or pi. And they suggest if your sample size is less than 40, use either the Wilson interval or the Jeffries, Jeffries prior interval. Uh, we will only talk about the Wilson's, Wilson interval in this class. Uh, if you're interested, section 6.6.1, uh, uh, I believe, talks about the Jeffries prior interval. Uh, you're not really losing anything by only talking about one of them. So, so the Wilson's, uh, Wilson interval uh, looks like this. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like um, a regular old confidence interval. I mean, there's some parts to it that look familiar, but there are parts of it that seem a little strange. So the, out in front, Instead of having a pi hat there, like what we did with the wall interval, we have what's called a pi tilde instead. And all this basically represents is an adjusted uh, estimated probability of success. So, you know, pi hat before was w divided by n. Now we're going to add a little adjustment to the numerator and add a little adjustment to the denominator. So that denominator, if let's say alpha was 0.05, the denominator will be n plus 1.96 squared. So we have an adjusted probab estimated probability of success there. We add and subtract, well, the usual 1 minus alpha divided by 2, divided by 2 quantile from a standard normal. But then we got a square root of n divided by n plus that quantile again squared. And we take the square root times some, we'll just call it stuff. So that, that's, that's the Wilson interval. This is better than a Wald interval. Well, where does it come from? Well, I would suspect that all of you in another stat course have talked about the following hypothesis test before. Uh, pi is equal to some constant. Uh, let's call it pi zero in the, uh, in, in the null hypothesis. And pi does not equal pi zero in the alternative hypothesis. And likely, this was the test statistic that you use. Does this look familiar to some people? Okay. Um, and so you got pi hat minus then the hypothesized value of pi zero divided by the square root of pi zero times one minus pi zero divided by n. Okay. Now the critical values for this particular hypothesis test were a negative one minus alpha divided by two quantile from the standard normal and a positive of that same quantum. So again, if alpha is 0.05, you have negative 1.96, positive 1.96. If your test statistic calculated, uh, that was calculated fell within those two critical values, what would you do? Reject or not reject? Not reject. Not reject. If it fell outside, you would reject. So what the Wilson interval does, it does what's called inverting the test. And what that means is, in statistics, is that now, instead of doing a test, you're going to do a confidence interval. You're going to find all possible values of pi zero that satisfy that equation. You might be thinking, well, how do you do that? Well, actually, it's an application of the quadratic equation that you learned about in your um, algebra class. 
in the homework for this section, you will see uh, that um, uh, you will see a discussion of the derivation. Actually, I kind of do it for you. It's really not too bad. But if you have questions about it, please let me know. So I already mentioned Jeffrey's prior interval. We're not going to talk about it in this class. Now, if n was greater than or equal to 40, um, uh, the author suggests, well, you can use the aggressive cool interval. Remember, we talked about that briefly, that paper, aggressive cool, 1998. Um, now, let me make sure it's clear. You can still use a Wilson interval or Jeffrey's prior interval if n is greater than or equal to 40. That's fine. It's just there are some. Is there a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, on the page 424, yep. when you have the actual confidence interval in the square root, yep. that is, that's supposed to be a hat. Or is it supposed to be a tilde? It is supposed to be a hat. Okay. Yep. yep. Sorry. No, that, that's fine. I think actually the first time I taught it, I actually I had a tilde there, and then I saw my typo. Um, Okay, so, so you can still use an, a, a Wilson interval, that's fine. And what you're going to notice is that the Wilson interval and the Gressy cool interval become very, 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 very similar to one another as n increases. It's just the Wilson interval gives you a little bit of, um, uh, it's a little bit better to use when your sample size is smaller. Um, the Gressy cool interval, as you're going to see, is a little bit easier to calculate, but you know, if you're using a computer, it's really not a big deal, um, calculation. Uh, the aggressive cool interval was actually introduced way back in 1998 as a as an interval that could be taught to intro stat students like a set um, um, 801 or even 218 uh, that uh, was easy to calculate um, and that, that was their motivation behind it but um, still it performs uh, rather well better than the than the wall interval even if n was less than 40. So this is what the interval looks like. Uh, you again start off with this adjusted estimated probability of success and then the rest of the interval then has a very similar form to what we saw with the wall. Plus or minus the value from the standard normal times pi tilde times, one, uh, times the square root of pi tilde times 1 minus pi tilde over n plus then that adjustment again. So essentially this is exactly the same as the wall interval but where we saw pi hat, you put a pi tilde. And also you make that corresponding adjustment that we saw with pi tilde for the sample size. So again, I guess I have that right there. There is that adjustment, that adjusted estimated probability of success. You see that little adjustment factor there? And that's why that comes in. So if alpha is 0 0.05, something interesting does happen in terms of uh, getting an, in, an intuitive understanding of what this interval is representing. Again, um, that z sub 1 minus alpha divided by 2 will be 1.96, or let's say just approximately 2. So if you put that 2, then wherever you have that quantile in your pi tilde formula, look what happens. Essentially what you're doing is you're adding two successes to the number of uh, you're adding 2 to the number of successes and you're adding 2 failures to your data as well. So you're adding 2 successes, 2 failures. So this here will be 2 successes plus 2 failures. So that's kind of interesting that you make this simple adjustment but yet your interval is better. Well one way to think about why this works is that you might remember last time how I told you that when the um, with the wall interval where it often has problems is for, for, for low values of pi and high values of pi. And so what this adjusted estimator for the probability of success does when, when you have let's say what a pi hat which would normally be let's say close to zero, notice what it's going to do, it's going to bump it up a little bit. When pi hat's close to one, it's going to bump it down a little bit and you end up with a better interval. So I, I basically um, have already mentioned this again. Aggressive cool and walled. Uh, aggressive cool is always better than the wall. Uh, well, I shouldn't say necessarily always, but 
it's it's generally speaking is is better than the wall. Wilson's generally better than the wall. Both of those intervals are better to use than the wall. And Wilson has some advantages when you have a lower sample size. So let's uh, look at how we can actually do the calculations. So again, this is my CI PI dot R program. Come over here. So again, uh, we had four successes out of 10 trials for kicking some field goals. We used 95% intervals. And so then pi hat in this particular case, of course, was 0.4. Now let's calculate then the adjusted estimate of pi. I think when I typed this, for some reason, my finger left off the I of pi. And so instead, I, instead of calling it pi dot tilde, I have p dot tilde. Sorry about that. It doesn't matter as long as you consistently use the same or uh, same object name throughout. So to calculate p dot tilde, uh, I have number of successes plus I grab from my normal distribution that quantile. I square it, and then I divide that whole thing by 2. And then I divide by n plus, again, that quantile squared. And so that my adjusted estimator is 0.427. Compare that to pi hat. That's a little bit higher. So then for the Wilson interval, then, I just simply program that equation that we saw into R. Um, or into my program first. Um, I'll let you look at the details of that, that part on your own. Uh, please make sure that you understand how I take advantage of how R does some of its calculations by using vectors. So for example, that Q norm there produces for me an upper and lower uh, quantile at the same time. And I get a Wilson interval then of 0.1682 to 0.6873. Let's take a look at the wall, the, I'm sorry, the Gressy cool. Again, you're essentially using the wall uh, formula, except for you're making some small adjustments. So first of all, my variance that I need for that Gressy cool interval, that stuff that's underneath the square root sign, I put a pi tilde here instead of a pi hat. And then I make that a little adjustment to my sample size as well. Again, I program everything in, and then I get an interval. Notice how similar the Wilson, uh, the Wilson and the aggressive cool intervals are. Now, there happens to be an easier way to do these calculations. I still think it's, um, it's good for you to do it the way that I just showed you, so you get use of how R does its calculations. Uh, but if you want a, a simpler way to do this, especially like when you're taking a test using the computers here, you want to do something that's really fast, here's the fastest way. There is a package called Binome in R. This is a package that you need to download yourself and install. And there's a nice little function called binome.compint. The first argument is x, that's our number of successes. The next argument is n, same as us. Specify your confidence level, and then what kinds of confidence interval methods do you want to use? This actually calculates a lot of different ones, and just to show you them all, I decided to say, let's calculate them all. So let's go ahead and do that. And there we go. So it calculates 11 different intervals. In fact, there's even more out there. Uh, but 11 different intervals for the probability of success. The Gressy cool is nicely labeled right there. The next one called asymptotic is actually the walled interval. The reason why it's called asymptotic is because it uses a large sample approximation. Asymptotic basically means as n goes to infinity, this is a, 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 an interval to use. Or uh, that's how you get the standard normal approximation, I should say, which then uses, uh, then that's how the interval comes about. And then lastly, you see the Wilson interval. Shortly, we will talk about another one called exact. And that will be the last one, last main one that we focus on. In the project itself, you're going to uh, come across this one right here called likelihood ratio test, or LRT, le likelihood ratio interval. Okay, so you know we can see. 
you know, these intervals are quite, yes? Um, so do we, um, as a rule of thumb, use the Wilson or the aggressive pool whenever yep. our pi is close to zero or one? And how close is Well, I think it's, it's more with respect to the sample size, not necessarily if it's close to zero, okay? Um, you know, use those two based upon what I told you about N. Um, I mean, you could always, again, use Wilson no matter what. Um, and then there's going to be this other interval called the exact. And it does have some advantages, but yet some disadvantages too. And I think it will be, um, you understand when to use one or the other. Okay. The main thing is don't use the wall. Okay. Um, again, there's not necessarily one interval that's always best for every situation. And so that's why we look at more than one. Um, if you notice here with these intervals, they're quite wide. And in, you know, for this kind of a setting, when we're talking about field goal kicking, do you think this interval is going to be useful? You know, imagine, let's say, you know, uh, our, our new coach, uh, Mike, Mike Riley, says, OK, Chris, tell me, should I kick this field goal or not? Give me a confidence, a 95% confidence interval for a 40 yard field goal here. And suppose I go do, do my get out R on the sideline, and I do my calculation, um, and I tell, oh, the probability of success for us is somewhere between 0.17 and 0.69, coach. What do you think his reaction is going to be? <laughs> He's going to say, well, geez, that's not very useful. It was kind of wide there. Um, so yeah, you know, why is it so wide here? Because we have a, quite a low sample size. But still, there are settings where having a, even a wide interval could be useful. Um, you know, let's say, you know, you want to do a hypothesis test um, where you want to know is the probability of success, um, you know, less than 0.5 or greater than 0.5. I'm sorry, let's say less than 0 0.05 or greater than 0 0.05. You depend upon how you set up your hypotheses then, well, it looks like probability of success is greater than 0 0.05. In fact, we're 95% confident that it's somewhere between 0.167 and 0.688. So there are particular settings where, yes, even a wide interval can be useful, but maybe not for football. OK, let's go to page 130. So I've been talking a lot about, yeah, the wall interval is not necessarily a good one to use. We looked at some of the reasoning behind it. Um, for example, uh, the, the, um, the lower bound could be below zero. The upper bound could be above one. The same thing could happen with aggressive cool. Even I, I might not mention that in the notes. So make sure you understand that. Same thing could happen with aggressive cool, where the lower bound could be less than zero which doesn't make sense for a probability, up about to be greater than zero. The Wilson interval, that cannot happen. Okay. But the main reason why the wall interval is something you shouldn't use is, is the, the following reason. So, you know, we have this confidence level. And, you know, we might state my confidence level is 95% for this confidence interval. And I use 0 0.05 in my confidence interval formula, and, and, and that's how I incorporate it. The problem is, even if you say 95%, it may not be truly 95%. It could be 90, it could be 80, it could be 70, or even lower. Which, if you're expecting 95% confidence, that's not good to have. So what we're going to be concerned about here today is talking about for this particular confidence interval, kind of confidence intervals, how we can calculate the true confidence level. So you have a stated level. That's this 95% that you state like with the interval. In other words, that 1 minus alpha times 100%. You have a stated level. And you also have what the true confidence level is. Probably most of you, especially unless you were in my class earlier today, you haven't ever talked about how to find a true confidence level before. And we're going to talk about that. So here are some plots that really dramatically make the case for why you don't want to use the wall. Um, so this comes from Brown et al's paper. And they said, well, let's let n be equal to 50. 
let's let alpha be 0 0.05. Let's calculate the true confidence level for essentially all possible values of pi between 0 and 1 for the Wald interval, for the Wilson interval, for the aggressive coordinate. So for example, if we look at the top plot there, it says wall interval. What we have on the x-axis here is possible values of pi. The y-axis, although um, it's, on, it's on your sheet, but it's kind of uh, it's chopped off here in my, my view here. It, right here on the y-axis, you have the true confidence level. So even though I state 95%, what is, it, what is the actual true confidence level? Notice we have dotted lines on all these plots that go across that are horizontal. This is at 0.95, the stated level. So if we take a look at pi equal to 0.184, which is right about there, and we project up here to, well, I can't draw a straight line very well. But you, dry, you project up to where you hit that sawtooth line that you see kind of going across that plot. And then if you project over, you know, I didn't draw it very well. But trust me, it intersects that line at a y-axis value of about 0.9. So even though I state that this wall interval should be 90%, I should have 90, 90 I should be 95% confident. Even though I state that, in fact, I'm only 90%. That's kind of, uh, um, kind of alarming. And, and it's, so we'll just do another example here. So suppose I'm at about 0.5. If I project up and over, well, that's a little bit better, about 0.935. But look how often the wall interval actually is at exactly 0.95 or close to it. Not very often. And look what happens as pi is going towards zero. Look what happens when pi is going towards one. Wow. And eventually, for extremely small values of pi, you're off the plot. You're below 0.86. That's not good. And I have a sample size of 50 here, which is not small. So, what do you think about using the Walden practice? That's, that's a problem. Now let's take a look at the Wilson interval. Now look at how these true confidence levels that are plotted are pretty much all between about 0.93 and 0.97 for most of the range of pi. So this is an, well it's not exactly 0.95, it sure is doing better than what the wall interval is doing. It does have some problems, extreme, extreme values of possible, possible values of pi. Take a look at the aggressive cool interval. Notice how from, from about here to there, it's very similar to that Wilson interval. The main difference between the walled and the aggressive cool comes about well, what happens with these smaller values Aggressive cool ends up being a little bit higher than that stated level. Okay, so what this plot is showing us again is the true confidence level for a 95% confidence interval for pi, where n is equal to 50. And we can see that the wall interval is just not performing like it should, like what it's stated. I mean, in fact, none of the intervals really, you know are exactly 0.95 for all values of pi. But at least the Wilson and the Gressy Cool are fairly close for a lot of values of pi. That's why we prefer them. Any questions? So is, is this because the normal distribution is not a good approximation of uh, distribution of uh, proportions? Well, that, that is essentially one of the big aspects that, you know, essentially you're using a continuous distribution, a normal distribution, to approximate a discrete distribution. 
Um, and in fact, that's why all of them, you see this bouncing up and down. It's due to the discreteness of the binomial. Because all are incorporating the normal s to some respect, but not necessarily always exactly the, the, the same way. So what, what, what are the other estimates doing differently? Well, I mean, for example, you saw that uh, the pi tilde that we use instead of the pi hat, for example. Okay, let's talk about how these plots are produced. After today, you'll actually be able to produce one of these plots. So, let's make sure that we, we really understand what a confidence level for a confidence interval means. And this gets into the whole idea of what frequentist-based inference is. There's two main paradigms in statistics. One's called frequentist-based, one's called Bayesian. Uh, I would assume that all of you in an intro stat course have learned about the frequentist. Uh, the Bayesian stuff, um, take a look at chapter six in my book, it discusses it there. You can't always fit everything into a class, okay? Um, so, this is what a, a confidence interval, confidence level of a confidence interval means. Uh, you know, suppose you were to go out and take a random sample, size, let's say 50, from a population. Calculate a 95% confidence interval. I don't, I don't care which one you use. And then look to see, is pi within the interval? Suppose somehow you knew what actually pi was. Then go out and take another random sample from that same population. Calculate that same kind of confidence interval. Should you expect to get exactly the same interval? Not necessarily because it's a different sample. Look, is this value of pi in the interval or not? And you keep on repeating this process over and over again. And essentially what you're looking at is, well, what is the relative frequency? Notice the word frequency for frequentist method. What's the relative frequency of pi being inside that interval? Suppose you did this 10,000 times. Well, if you're calculating 95% intervals, you would expect 9,500 of them to contain pi. The problem is, though, that doesn't happen. That's your expectation, but unfortunately it doesn't happen. Well, unless you can somehow take a sample size and fit. Good luck. Um, and so what the true confidence level is, then, is what is the actual proportion of times that the pi is inside these 10,000 intervals? Um, in other words, you're looking at how often does the, do these 10,000 intervals cover pi? And so instead of people using the phrase true confidence level, you often hear people call, call this coverage, the coverage level. Same thing, just, just different name. I like true confidence level. So how were then the plots on this preview page uh, calculated? Well, one way to do this is let's say Choose pi to be 0.5. Now we've talked about in class how you could simulate samples from a binomial distribution with pi equal 0.5. You know, use the R binomial function. Use n equal 50, let's say. Let's say we get 10,000 samples, calculate a confidence interval for every single sample, and look at the proportion of times that the interval contains 0.5. Then, how about you choose another value of, a point, of, of pi? Suppose um, 0 0.5005. Do exactly the same thing. Simulate, simulate the data, calculate this estimated true confidence level. And keep on doing that for all values of pi from 0 0.0005 to 0 0.9995 by 0 0.0005. That's essentially how they got that plot. Okay? Essentially. They actually did something that was, was a little bit easier. I'll tell you what, what it was shortly, but that's essentially what they did. And what that is called is Monte Carlo simulation. Again, Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, an essential tool in statistics to evaluate how good is our confidence interval. You could do it with hypothesis tests, you could do it with estimators in themselves to evaluate how good are they. So, <clears throat> let's talk about how we can do this in R. So this is on page 33. 
my, my corresponding program, which does it, is conflevel.r. Now, in my book, I use n equal 40, so that's what the, the, the program is set up for, and also I use a different value of pi. Um, I, ch I, 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 I decided to leave my, um, my example here corresponding um, uh, to n equal 50 uh, to correspond to the Brown et al. paper. Um, since that plot was produced by that paper, I couldn't put that plot in my book. That would be, uh, that would be called plagiarism. So that's why I chose n equal 40 for my book. Um, I'm going to though talk about fr uh, from an n equal 50 perspective, and we're going to work with 0 0.84, 0 0.184 for pi. Okay. Now, also, I'm also I'm only going to take 1,000 samples just because uh, of time constraints. Not that it would take that long, much longer to do 10,000. Let's talk about talk about how we could do this. So I'm going to set alpha. I'm going to set pi. I'm going to set uh, n. Now, you're going to see that you know, this is going to take some code. But you know, don't be overwhelmed by it. Think of my code as a template for your own code when you have to do some stuff like this on your own. Uh, also, um, uh, remember a way to, to figure out what each of these lines of code uh, do. And that is execute them one at a time and look at the results. That's a great way to learn how to use R. Okay, so the number of samples I'm going to take is 1,000. I'm going to set a seed so I can reproduce my results. And then I'm going to use the R by known function, just like what we did uh, previously, to simulate 1,000 samples from a binomial distribution where there are 50 trials and pi is 0.184. So just to show you that indeed there's 1,000 there, there we go. So the on uh, sample number 1,000, I got w equal 8. And we can summarize it if we wanted to, uh, similar to how we did before with the table function. And we can see that uh, for w equal 10, I got that about 14.6% of the time. Any questions so far? So what I would like to do now is for all these 1,000 w's, calculate my wall of confidence. So we're going to look at the wall of confidence interval here um, rather than the other ones. But the other ones, it's essentially you do the same, same uh, you, you implement the same ideas. So I'm going to calculate pi hat. So remember, there's 1,000 different things in W. So that means I'm going to get 1,000 different pi hats. Um, and then I'm going to calculate the variance that's in that walled confidence interval formula, that pi hat times 1 minus pi hat divided by n. Now remember how, wall, how R does its calculations. This pi dot hat has 1,000 items in it. One has, of course, just one thing. And then I take 1 minus pi hat here. So how do you think R is going to approach this calculation here? You've got one thing that has just one, one element, and then you have another thing that has 1,000 elements. How's it going to do it? It's going to take the first element of pi dot hat, take one minus it. Take, go to the second element, um, go to the second element of pi dot hat, take one minus it, and so on. And this is what we get. Now, when I take one minus pi dot hat times pi dot hat, how's R going to approach this? Both of the things have 1,000 elements in it. And it's basically going to do what's called element-wise multiplication. It's going to look at the first element of pi dot hat, first element of 1 minus pi dot hat, multiply them. Go to the second element of both, do the same thing. I like to talk with my hands sometimes. <laughs> and then lastly, it divides by n. So then in the end, this var dot wall, how many elements is, is it going to have? 1,000. So we've got 1,000 variances. So don't you multiply by n? Y divided by n, and that basically did it for every single element divided by n. Any questions? Okay. Now I want to find the lower limit of this confidence interval. So I'm going to take my 1,000 pi hats, subtract off my one quantile from the standard normal, times the square root of my 1,000 variances. So 
each that square root is applied to every single element of var dot wall one at a time so you're left with again a thousand so here are my 1,000 lower bounds do the same thing for my upper bounds as well and then lastly let's put this all together so you can see what's going on so I'm going to combine everything into a, a data frame so I say W hi hat my lower bound my upper bound and if I were just to execute this how many lines of output would I have 1,000 I'm going to make it a little bit easier and just look at the first 10 so this is a basically you can call particular elements by row and instead of putting particular columns here I leave that blank and I only pull out uh, or and that means I pull out all of them. And there we go what's another way you could have done this to, to show these 10 does anyone remember head yep by default you get the first six <laughs> and if you put n equal 10 as an additional element or different additional argument you would get 10 as well okay so pi is 0.184 Okay. Does that interval, let's say, work? Yeah. Pi 0.184 is in there. How about the uh, third interval? Did it work? Mm -hmm. Yep. How about the eighth interval? Uh oh, didn't work. So that w equal 5, whenever you have w equal 5, that interval is not going to contain pi. What I would like to know now, not just for those 10, so actually if you look at only one of those 10 did the interval not contain 0.184. Instead of me having to look at all 1,000 and inspect, is pi uh, equal to 0.184 inside the interval, what I'm going to do instead is have r tell me if it's in the interval or not. And the way you can do that is using an if-else function. Excel has if-else functions as well. Uh, it works basically the same way if you've, if you've used that before. So I say if else, and I want to test something. I want to test, is my pi, 0.184, greater than my lower bound? This test is applied to all 1,000 different items in the, word, in, in the object lower, simultaneously. And if it is true, well, how about we do another if else? Let's check, is pi less than my upper bound? If it is, yay, pi's in, in my interval. If it's not, mm, I'm going to assign it a value of 0. And in fact, if pi was not greater than the lower bound, of course that means it's, it's less than the, uh, the lower bound then, I'm also going to assign a value of 0. So I'm going to put that in an object called save. If I did head save, you can see I have the first six that worked. And remember that eighth interval right there where it didn't work? There's that zero. So I have a bunch of ones and zeros. Ones if the interval worked, zeros if it didn't. And so what I would like to do now is find well, what proportion the intervals work. How can you do that? Well, just take the mean of these ones and zeros. And so my estimated true confidence level is 0.898. I call it estimated because I'm doing 1,000 simulated data sets rather than, let's say, infinity data sets. <laughs> somehow do that, which would give you the exact true confidence level. So, that's how you can calculate this stuff. And you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to demonstrate this, so this is an example of Monte Carlo simulation, is that you know, th these ideas can be applied in so many different other places. And we will look at that in our course. But even outside this course, you're going to run into Monte Carlo simulation a lot. And so it's good to have, if you haven't already, uh, have some basic understanding of how Monte Carlo simulation works, just like this. 
Are there any questions? Okay. <clears throat> so this takes us to page 35 then. Now there's another way to think about how to come up with this true confluence level instead of using Monte Carlo simulation. What we've basically done with Monte Carlo simulation is looked at how often, or I should say, well, what was the relative frequency of getting, let's say, a four? What was the relative frequency of getting a five? What was the relative frequency of getting a six and so on? So if you remember when we uh, first looked at uh, simulation with our binomial before, when we were simulating data, what we said was, well, what we could do is simply oops, take this, these counts and divide by, well, what was my sample size? And I get the relative frequencies. These relative frequencies were estimating what? Pi is given number, number success. Excuse me? The pi given the number of success. Uh, not necessarily the, the, the pi. I don't think you, you got it quite right. Anybody else want to approach this? Okay, so I'm simulating data from a binomial distribution. Okay, I'm taking 1,000 samples. So what we see there for those, um, those uh, proportion of sixes, proportions of sevens, proportion of eights, are estimating what? The probability mass function for a binomial. Go back in the notes, you'll, you'll see when we actually looked at that. So maybe what we could do instead, instead of just taking 1,000 samples, why don't we just use the actual probabilities and, 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 and maybe try to calculate a true confidence level that way. Let me back up a second. Now, what you could do is actually calculate the confidence interval for W equal 2, confidence interval for W equal 3. And if you look at them all, you will notice that starting with W equals 6, and up to w equal 15, the confidence interval contains pi. w less than 6, w greater than 15, the confidence interval does not contain pi. So that 0.898 that we got, you could actually obtain it as well by summing all these probabilities that I'm highlighting right now, or the, these estimated proportions, um, and also these as well and you'll get 0.898. So why don't we, instead of using those estimates based upon 1,000 simulated data sets, how about we just substitute the regular old binomial probabilities? And that's how you can get what's called the exact true confidence level. And that's exactly what Brown et al. did in their paper. Let's talk about how we can do that. So page 36, then, gives an algorithm uh, to go about doing this. Okay. First of all, find all possible intervals that one could have with w equals 0, 1, up to n. So how many different intervals? n plus 1. n plus 1. So there's going to be n plus 1 intervals. So with that example that we looked at, where n was 50, there's going to be just 51 intervals. So you only have to look at 51 intervals and look to see, is pi in that interval or not? So to help us count or, or determine, I should how, how about, uh, let me say that again, to help us uh, designate if pi is in that interval or not. How about we call, well we create what's called in statistics or math in general, an indicator function. So my indicator function, I use the letter i for indicator, it's going to be a function of w. If my interval contains pi, my indicator function is going to be a 1. Otherwise, if it doesn't contain pi, it's going to be a 0. So that means for us, from w equals 6 to 15, i sub w is going to be 1. For all the other values of w, it's going to be a 0. Then, calculate the true confidence level this way. I'm going to sum over all possible values of w. I'm going to plug in my indicator function 
times my probability mass function for a binomial. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get 0 plus 0 because that i is going to be either 0 or 1. Of course, 0 times anything is 0. And I'm going to have that where w equals 0 to 5, then plus 1 times whatever that probability is for w equals 6. And I'm running out of room. So we'll go down here. Plus 1 times that probability for w equals 7. Plus all the way up to 1 times the probability for w equals 15. Plus 0 times well, that probability for w equals 16. And all the way up to uh, w equals 50. I don't know, maybe that's more than what I needed to do just to show you what that sum represents, but that's, that's what it represents. Any questions? So <clears throat> let's actually implement this. So in that same program then, let's calculate now the true confidence level, the exact true confidence level. I guess if you wanted to emphasize this, you could put the word exact here. Okay, so I'm going to find all my possible values of w. I'm going to put in a vector called w, so zero to n. Find my pi hats. Find all my probabilities, just like what we did before when we were first looking at d binome. Let me go ahead and do that. So, for example, PMF. Oops. There's my probabilities for w equals zero all the way up to w equals 50. I'm going to find all my variances. I'm going to find all my lower bounds, my upper bounds. And I'm going to use the same if-else function that we did before to determine is my indicator variable, I'm sorry, is my indicator equal to 1 or is equal to 0? So let me go ahead and do that. And then remember what we're doing here. We're simply multiplying, let me go back here. We're simply multiplying that 0 or that 1 times that binomial probability. So I'm going to take my 1s and zeros, multiply it by the probabilities in PMF. And that's what I get. I want to sum them up. So let's sum them up. And there's the exact true confidence level, 0 0.903. So that's what was actually on that plot when we first saw it. questions? Okay, so now you know how to do one, uh, now you know how to, for, for one value of pi, find the true confidence level. Suppose I wanted to find the, uh, the true confidence level for pi equals 0 0.0005 to 0.9995 by 0 0.0005. What would you do? Cry? Suppose you want to repeat this process over and over again. Um, what's a way, maybe, you know, for some of you, especially if you've had any kind of computer programming before, what would be a way to repeat the same process over and over and over again for different values of pi? Excuse me? A for loop. A for loop, exactly. So, page 138 of my uh, uh, the notes. talks about two programs, and also my book also talks about these in more detail. Conf levels walled only dot r, where I do this for just the walled interval. So I just, re, just essentially duplicate like that plot that we saw just for the walled interval. And then my other program here, conf level for intervals dot r, does exactly the same thing, but now for the walled, for the Wilson, for the Gress C. Cool, and also this other interval that we're going to look at called the Clockwork Pearson. Okay? I want to talk about a little bit, so I understand that probably some of you have never seen for loops before. I want to talk about this first program a little bit in class. 
Again, the book uh, talks about it in a little bit more detail. So here's my program. I've set it up for the n equal 50 example that we've been talking about in the notes. The program itself is set up for the book, which is n equal 40. Okay. So what I would like to do then, I'm going to set alpha, set n, set my values of w, set pi hat, just like I just got done doing. Okay. I'm going to calculate all my intervals. So how many intervals am I going to have? How many values of W do I have? One. 51. Yeah. Okay. Next, I'm going to anchor, I'm going to set something called pi.seq for sequence. Because I want to re replicate this thing for all my possible values of pi. I decided to start at 0 0.001, go up to 0.999 by 0 0.005. So if I put that using the SEQ function for sequence into that vector, this is what we get. Again, notice how I'm showing you kind of step by step by just running it and then investigating what the code does. So those are all the values of pi that I want to do this for. Next, I need to somehow save these true confidence levels for every di different value of pi. So I'm going to set up a, a matrix that I can save the information into. And you can kind of just think of this as a data set, where I'm going to initialize the values in this matrix to be NAs for, well, I haven't put anything in there yet. The number of rows I'm going to have is going to correspond to the number of pi's that I have. The number of columns, the first column is going to be all my pi's, the second column is going to be the true confidence levels. So I'm going to do that. Just to show you, how about if I do a head instead? There we go. And then I'm going to need to create something called counter. I'm going to give it a value of 1. You'll see why I need to do that shortly. Okay, so here's my for loop. For pi in pi dot sequence, do the following. So what's going to happen is, my very first value of pi dot sequence is 0 0.001. So I'm going to say, so this code is going to say, let's let pi be 0 0.001 first. Find the probability mass function. Look at all the intervals. Is pi within the interval? Find the true confidence level. And then let's put the results into this save.true.conf matrix. The way I do that is I combine pi and wall together. And I put that into, in this case, row 1 of my matrix. And then I increment my counter so that now it's going to be 2. These brackets here represent the part where my for loop is. Once it hits this bracket, it's going to come back up. And it's going to now find the next value of pi. So the next value of pi was 0 0.0015. And it's going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to repeat this process over and over again. To make this a little bit easier to see the first time that we do this, I'm going to put two values of pi in there. So I just combine together 0.1 and 0.2. And then also, I'm going to uncomment that, and I'm going to put a print statement there. Print statements are very good to use in for loops so that you can see what's going on. And what is it going to print? It's going to put print what I had just put into the counter row. So let's try this. Let's run it. So when pi was 0.1, my true confidence level, 0.878. When pi was 0.2, true confidence level, 0.937. Let me change it back. And let's see what happens. Um, I want to comment that. Oops. Let me try it again. Okay. So now if I look at head save.true.conf, if I can spell it, here's my first six true confidence levels I just calculated. Again, the first column is pi. Second column is a true confidence level. 
So the true confidence level for a walled interval when pi is 0 0.001 is what? 0 0.048. 0 0.048. Is that good? No, it's not good. Okay, so you can see how poorly the wall could do. Now again, I understand for some of you, if you don't, haven't had much programming experience in the past, that this code can be kind of complicated. The key is execute the code line by line to see what it does and use my code as a template. Because you'll need to use this for the project for a different interval. Okay. Let's do a graph. So what I'm going to do, although I didn't need to do this, I'm going to open up a graphics window. Graphics windows will automatically pop up if you, if you don't do this. I just wanted to control the size of it. And then I'm going to plot on my x-axis all my values of pi, on my y-axis my true confidence levels, put some nice titles in my plot. Type equal L corresponds to, I want a line plot. If I don't do that, I get uh, open circles instead. If I want everything nicely joined together with a line, I'm going to put a horizontal line on my plot at 0.95 as well. Let me run that. And there we go. Does that plot look familiar? It's exactly what was in that paper. Okay. Are there any questions? So again, you know, my expectations of students is that you understand how to work with all of this R code. You understand what every line of the code does. If this is unfamiliar to you, what you should do after class is again, run it line by line. And if you still have questions, you need to ask, okay? Again, I understand for some students this will be complicated or if, if, if you don't have a whole lot of programming experience to begin with. But it's an essential part of, of being able to do statistics is to understand how to get what you need programmed into a software package, in this case R. Okay. Um, let's see here. Why don't we talk about the project and, and we'll see how long it takes. So I finalized the project last night and then I forgot to tell all of you to go to the uh, website and print it off before class, so that meant I had to print it off myself. Okay, so there are three problems. Problems one and two, you can do most of it. Problem number three, you're not going to be able to do until section 1.2. This project is due Wednesday, February 4th at noon. Remember, you're going to be handing in everything to me electronically, so you will need to email me a electronic copy that's in Word. You'll need to email it to me. You can work in groups of up to three people on this project. If maybe you're unfamiliar with people in this class uh, and you would still like to work in a group, post a message to the listserv and say, hey, does anyone need a group member? I often have that done by students in my classes at the beginning of the semester. Um, now, the way that I would like um, uh, this done is, you know, problem number one, so you get one A. So you, you list out one A in your Word file, you put in your answer, there's gonna be some R code, there's gonna be some R output. The R code and output needs to look exactly as it does in my lecture notes. So if we take a quick look, here are my lecture notes. Notice how I, I basically copied from my R console window. I copied all the code and then also the output that was inside of it. I want to see step by step what the output is um, as I have shown here in to re to that respect. I want to see it like this. I don't want to see the code separate with the output separate. I want to see it like this because I want to see what you're doing uh, along, along the way. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to grade it that way. Also, you will need to format the text so it looks nice. Notice how I use a courier font here. 
Uh, that's typically what's done with computer code uh, because every, every character has exactly the same width. Otherwise, if you change this, for example, to, um, oh, we'll do it Arial, Let's see what happens. Notice how things are no longer nicely lined up anymore. So that's why use a courier font. Also, notice how I have indented certain things. As if a line goes down, if a code, if a, um, a set of code goes down to the next line, notice how I indent it because it's a e lot easier to read. You know, alternatively, you know, you would have something that looks like this maybe, and that just doesn't look very nice. Okay, so I want your code and output to look exactly like it is in my notes. Sorry to be picky, but I have to grade a lot of these, and if everything looks nice, it makes it a lot easier for me. And plus, once you're done with this class, and you need to let me maybe present your advisor with something, some R stuff, or even when you're out in the real world working, you want your stuff to look nice. I try to get my lecture, no look, lecture notes to look nice. I'm not necessarily perfect, but I try. Please try as well. Okay, so problem number one is exercise number three in the book. And um, let's see. So even if you don't have a copy of the book yet, uh, number three is in the Google. Good. <laughs> uh, 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 number uh, number three is in the Google preview. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's actually based upon um, a paper that was in the Journal of Statistics Education. Uh, for those of you who maybe are teaching SET 218, uh, that is a, a nice resource to use to get ideas of, for teaching. Um, and, and it's a very simple classroom experiment that this, this paper talks about um, that's used to help um, students understand variability from sample to sample to sample and also to help calculate a confidence interval for a proportion. And simply what they did was this. They took some milk chocolate Hershey's Kisses. So for example, uh, where's my... So these things here. They took 10, they put it in kind of a big cup, shook it up, and then dumped it on the table. And they counted the number of Hershey kisses that end up lying on its base like this, rather than, let's say, uh, slanted over or, or, or whatever. So they did that for 10. They put the Hershey kisses back in the cup, mixed it up again, dumped it. And they kept on doing this so that essentially they, uh, well, they did 10 times. So in fact, you could say uh, they have 100, um, uh, I don't call it, uh, 100 Bernoulli observations, you could say. Um, and they recorded the number of times that it was upright like this. And I believe it was 38. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple experiment. I mean, 39, excuse me. So, what I want you to do is estimate, well, what, what is the probability of success? Where success is defined as the Hershey kiss. Well, I guess I took that off. The Hershey kiss is on its base. So part A says, well, describe the assumptions that would be needed to use one binomial distribution with 10 trials. I'm emphasizing that. One binomial distribution with 10 trials. I'm sorry, 100 trials, excuse me. <laughs> uh, one binomial distribution with 100 trials. Notice how things are done with this experiment. We have 10 cups might have some other problems too that you have to deal with. Remember those five characteristics of a binomial that we talked about with respect to a fugal kicking? You should look back at those and use that then as your discussion to answer part A. I can think of at least two problems with their um, experiment. Part B, well let's say everything's okay uh, and let's compute the wall, the grassy cool Wilson, and then also this new interval called Clapper Pearson that maybe we'll get to, we'll see. Interpret the intervals. So you could say with 95% confidence, um, uh, the probability of success is between such and such. Part C, which confidence interval method do you think is best for this type of setting? Now you answer that question not with respect to, well, like the width of the interval, 
you answer it with respect to, well, what we have learned about today with respect to true confidence. So here's a hint. Do you think you, you're going to pick the wall? OK. There might be more than one, more, more than one uh, best interval. OK, that's OK. But relate it to the true confidence levels, what you've learned. So you're doing parts A through C for this particular problem. And I thought this would be interesting as well. Let me go back to it. Complete part B with your own data. So if you want to go out and get some Hershey's Kisses and share some with me, uh, <laughs> oh, you don't have to. Uh, but get some Hershey's Kisses, actually do it yourself. And just to prove to me that you did it, well, videotape yourself. Well, record yourself. Yes. Create a video. Post it to YouTube. Give me the link. I'll look at it to verify that you did it. And I'll also I'll post the, the video to my website as well. <laughs> it's up to you. It's extra credit. So that's problem number one. Are there any questions? Part or number two. Uh, you're doing exercise 13 in the book. Um, and since maybe some of you don't, does, any, does anyone not have a book yet? So a few. So because of that, I, um, I, I did copy in number 13 here just to help you out. Uh, hopefully I won't have to do, do that again, but uh, uh, we'll see if those books get, get, get over here from, uh, from, the, from the boat. Um, the, you know, there, like I said, there's many different confidence intervals for probability success. And I want you to explore another one called a Likert ratio interval. Uh, this is actually a fairly good one, to be honest. Um, and I want you to do the following with it. Part A, I guess I should say number 13 actually wasn't in the Google preview. For some reason, um, my publisher cut off the Google preview uh, somewhere between problem number 3 and problem number 13. So uh, I want you to calculate this, this thing called a Likert ratio interval. Um, I give details about the interval in my book, how it's actually calculated. Um, especially look at, um, um, we're going to talk about hypothesis, well, the, the book talks about hypothesis tests for pi. It's discussed in that part of the book. I want you to verify that when n is equal to 10, w is equal to 4, just like what we've been doing, that you get that interval. The calculation is actually rather simple because of that binome.confident function. Okay, then part B. Just like what we did with the wallet interval, that true confidence level plot, do it for the Likert ratio interval. So essentially, you're going back to my program And instead of doing, let's see now, instead of doing the wall, you're going to do the Likert ratio interval. But I think, if I remember right, you pretty much used all the rest of the code. So again, that's how you're using my code as a template for, for your own use. Then, compare the Likert ratio intervals, true confidence levels, to those of those four other intervals that we've essentially uh, discuss in class. We've discussed three so far. We will discuss the fourth shortly, the clock of Pearson. Compare them. Which one's better? You know, there might be more than one, 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 one right answer, but I think you, you'll see that, you know, you prefer probably one of the intervals over the other ones. After all, we talked about the Wilson interval. We didn't talk about the Likert ratio interval, so that should be a hint. So, that's part, uh, that's uh, number two. Again, uh, number three there is going to uh, um, be over section 1.2 material. Okay, so that's project number one. Are there any questions? Okay, we got about five minutes left, and so that you can complete the Clapper Pearson part of problem number one, I want we get get started with it. Okay, it's called the Clopper-Pearson interval because Clopper and Pearson came up with it. 
And it's based upon the beta distribution. Uh, and I would, would expect that some of you have seen the beta distribution before, but some of you probably have not. Uh, the beta distribution is just another probability distribution like a normal, like a T distribution, uh, but it has some nice little characteristics to it that make it uh, work very well for this, this particular problem where we want to uh, come up with an interval for a probability of success. In particular, a, a random variable that has a beta distribution, that random variable is, um, is between 0 and 1. can't be outside of there. So it's kind of like a probability of success. Probability of success is between 0 and 1. So if I have a random variable that's between 0 and 1, hmm, maybe then that beta distribution could, could help you. In fact, it can. So let's let V, I'm not for sure why I chose the letter V, but I did. Let V be a random variable from a beta distribution. And this is what the beta distribution looks like. And again, V has to be between 0 and 1. A and B are parameters. Just like mu and sigma squared for a normal, uh, just like the degrees of freedom for a T distribution, A and B are parameters. This uppercase gamma there, that represents what's called in mathematics the gamma function. If you've never seen the gamma function before, this is what it looks like, or what it is. Let's say I have some number C that's an integer. Gamma of C is essentially C minus 1 factorial. So if C was 10, gamma of 10 would be 9 factorial. If C is not an integer, it gets a little bit more complicated, and you have to use some calculus to actually find <coughs> what the gamma function is. Now, the reason why we're going to be using the beta distribution is solely because we want to find a particular quantile from the beta distribution. So just like what you learn in your very first stat course, when you're dealing with a normal distribution, <coughs> uh, let's see. Oh, we'll, we'll do a standard normal. So if I want to find the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile from a standard normal distribution, let's actually plot that so I can relate it to a beta. So if, let's say if alpha is greater than, um, um, uh, let's see. Well, let's say that 1 minus alpha divided by 2 might be about 0.95, so that I am on the right-hand side of the distribution. So here's my quantile. Now, how this is actually found relies on some calculus. If I take the integral from negative infinity up to, uh, let's say, z sub 1 minus alpha divided by 2, of my standard normal distribution. Set it equal to 1 minus alpha divided by 2. And if I solve this expression for z sub 1 minus alpha divided by 2, that's how you get the quantile. In case you've never seen it in a calculus context, that, that's how you would get it. And so, we are interested in the V sub alpha quantile from a beta distribution. So if you solve for V sub alpha, you know, pick maybe alpha 0.05. If you solve that, you get the quantile. So uh, depending upon the kind of beta distribution you have, it might be something that looks like this. Oh, we'll go with one that looks like that. And maybe, suppose here's alpha, here's 1 minus alpha, there's V sub alpha right there. That's the number that we're looking for. Here are some plots of various beta distributions, if you've never seen it. In particular, there's one right here for a distribution that all of you have seen before. Um, fortunately, I forgot to put zeros and ones here. So again, V is between 0 and 1. What distributions plot in that, that, uh, that uh, plot that I, I circled? Uniform. uniform, yeah. So that, that should look familiar to you. It's a uniform distribution. So when A is equal to uh, 1, B is equal to 1, that is a uniform distribution. So this is beta A comma B. And I know we're just, we're out of time now, but here's what the Clapper-Pearson looks like. 
Simply, I take the alpha divided by 2 quantile from a beta distribution where A is equal to the number of successes, B is equal to the number of failures plus 1. That's my lower bound. My upper bound is the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile where A is the number of successes plus 1 and B is the number of failures. So, is this interval guaranteed to always be between 0 and 1 like the Wilson interval? Yes or no? Well, we're out of time. I'll let you think about it. We'll, we'll talk about it on Thursday. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.